Yeah. You're all very welcome to this event at LSE, and if I, as an Irish person, I can take the liberty of wishing you all a happy St. Patrick's Day as well. It's lovely to see people here. Um, my name is Dr. Heather Jones, Associate Professor in International History here at LSE, and it's my very great pleasure to chair this evening's event. And as chair, one of my most enjoyable tasks is effectively to welcome you uh, to this launch of the Global Transformation, History, Modernity and the Making of International Relations by Barry Buzan and George Lawson, published by Cambridge University Press in their Cambridge Studies and in International Relations series. And we're extremely fortunate to have a very eminent panel here this evening to discuss the book um, and the important questions it raises regarding how the 19th century created a particular a configuration of factors that get, gave rise to a macro transformation of international relations and in many ways the birth of our own modernity uh, as, as is argued by Barry and George. And as our speakers tonight, we have first uh, the authors, Barry Buzan, who's a, a prolific author and emeritus professor in the Department of International Relations here at the LSE and a fellow of the British Academy. Um, and I've been told that Barry has written on everything, uh, ranging from security to sci-fi and everything in between, uh, in terms of how I was to introduce him. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to pick out any of his books because we'd be here all night. Um, and our second author, uh, George Lawson, who's an associate professor in the Department of International Relations here at the LSE. Um, is a, he's a specialist in revolutions and historical sociology and IR. So both of the authors are going to be speaking and presenting uh, the book in a moment. We also have a panel of discussants who have been invited to commentate on the book and their responses to it. Um, we have Professor Craig Calhoun, uh, immediately to my, to my left, Director and President of the London School of Economics and Political Science, who needs no inter introduction, I'm sure. We have Jürgen Osterhammel, who's Professor of Modern and Contemporary History at the University of Constance, and who's a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, and I believe is to be inaugurated at the British Academy tomorrow. Uh, so uh, many congratulations on that. And then we also have Aisha Zarakol uh, to my right, a university lecturer in international relations at the University of Cambridge, and a fellow of Emmanuel College. And our three discussant panelists have been chosen as they effectively, um, George explained, represent the book's three main constituencies. International relations, which is Aisha, historical sociology, Craig, and global history, which is Jürgen. So we have a really interdisciplinary panel here tonight. And our order this evening will be as follows. First, our two authors, Barry and George, will co-present the book together, uh, with George going first, I believe, uh, followed, by, uh, followed by Barry. And then we will have Aisha, Jürgen and Craig in that order who will provide their comments in turn. Um, we will then have a chance for the panellists and the authors to respond to each other's discussion points uh, and then I'll open it to the floor for questions and answers. So we should have a good 30 minutes or so uh, for a Q&A uh, between you and, and, our, and our panel um, and, and the authors. Please note that the events tonight are recorded um, and it is hoped that a podcast of the event will be made available online afterwards. Please also note that, like any good book launch, copies of the book are available outside for purchase after the event. Uh, should you, uh, uh, all of you uh, wish, to, uh, wish to purchase it, uh, the opportunity is there. Um, and I hope you all will uh, take the opportunity. It's really an excellent read. Um, and can I also remind you to make sure your mobile phones are on silent. Uh, this is very important. If you wish to tweet about the event during it, the hashtag is LSEIR. And that's the hashtag for this evening's event. Um, I'd also like to sincerely thank the IR department for funding tonight's event. Um, it's extremely uh, important, this, this kind of event, um, and the authors in particular uh, want to express their thanks uh, for that. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to simply congratulate our two authors on their, on their achievement. Uh, after all, a launch is a wonderful occasion of sending a book out into the world, as it were, and, and, and what a book. I mean, what, what a synthesis. It, 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 for, as a historian, I always marvel at the way it, uh, international relations authors cover such large periods of time. Um, it's a real tour de force, and a very important and stimulating one about the roots of our modern globalized world. Um, so I'll hand over to George uh, to present on the book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, she, you said it all, I think. It's, 
wonderful synthesis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but thanks to the International Relations Department for supporting the event. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. My job is to briefly outline the argument of the book, and then Barry will talk, hopefully, equally briefly about its implications. So this is the book, uh, snazzy cover and all, as Heather says, available outside. And this is our argument. During the long 19th century, by which we mean the period from 1776 until 1914, a global transformation remade the basic structure of international order. This transformation involved a complex configuration of industrialization, rational state building, and ideologies of progress. And let me say at the outset what Barry and I mean by these terms. By industrialization, we mean the commercialization of agriculture and the two-stage industrial revolution. The first stage defined by cotton, coal, and steam power with its center in Britain, largely during the first half of the 19th century. The second stage defined by steel, electricity, chemicals, and internal combustion engines with its center in Germany, largely during the last quarter of the 19th century. Together, the commercialization of agriculture and the two-stage industrial revolution generated an intensely interdependent system of global capitalism. And the extension of capitalism to a global scale brought new opportunities for accumulating power, not least because of the close relationship between industrialization and dispossession. Indeed, industrialization in some places, such as Britain, was in deeply interwoven with and indeed premised upon the deindustrialization and dispossession of others, not least in this case, India. By rational state building, we mean the process by which administrative and bureaucratic competences were accumulated and caged within national territories. This process was not pristine. Rather, as we show in the book, processes of rational state building and imperialism were co-implicated. Most 19th century nation states in the West were imperial nation states. And imperialism over there fed into rational state building over here. The modern professional civil service was formed in India before being exported to Britain. Techniques of surveillance, such as fingerprinting and file cards, were developed in the colonies and subsequently imported into the metropoles. Cartographic techniques used to map colonial spaces were re-imported into Europe to serve as the basis for territorial claims, and so on. So domestically rational states provided facilitative institutional frameworks for the development of industry, science, technological innovations, the professionalization of academic disciplines and institutions, such as the LSE, formed in 1895. And abroad, they provided the sustenance for imperial polities. Both functions were underpinned by what we call ideologies of progress. By ideologies of progress, we mean assemblages of beliefs, concepts, and values that address how polities, economies, and symbolic orders relate to each other, how individuals and groups fit into those assemblages, and how human coll collectivities should be governed. In the book, we highlight the impact of four ideologies of progress, liberalism, nationalism, socialism, and scientific racism. As with the other causal dynamics we stress, there was a dark side to ideologies of progress, and not just with scientific racism. The promise of progress was linked closely to a standard of civilization that served as the legitimating currency for coercive practices against both barbarians, understood as peoples with an urban high culture, the oriental despotism, so-called, of the Ottomans, the Japanese, the Indians, and the Chinese, and savages, which meant more or less everyone else. Now, the three components of the global transformation are mutually reinforcing. For example, European imperialism was legitimated by one or more of the ideologies of progress and enabled through military superiority, mechanisms of state control, and infrastructural developments that had their roots in industrialization. To be clear, our argument is not that any one of these dynamics on their own could have constituted the global transformation, hence why in the slide we've got arrows pointing down from all three to our overarching argument. It's the combination of the three together that produce this particular transformation. They are a set of interlinked processes that come together in historically specific form. And it's this configuration that produces the transformation itself, generating a shift from a polycentric world with no dominant center to a core periphery order in which the center of gravity resides in the West. Let me briefly illustrate this point and how it worked. So until the late 18th century, the principal points of wealth differentiation were within rather than between societies. For example, there were no major differences in terms of living standards between the most developed parts of the world. In the late 18th century, GDP per capita levels in the Yangtze River Delta region of China were around 10% lower than the wealthiest parts of Europe, which is about the same as the differences today between much of the EU 
uh, for the moment anyway, and the United States. In 1750, the Yangtze region produced as much cloth per capita as Britain did 50 years later. And overall, a range of quality of life indicators, whether you look at levels of life expectancy or calorie intakes, indicate a basic equivalence between China and Europe until around 1800. And I'll illustrate this in a moment. But during the 19th century, this story of basic equivalence changes, and it changes dramatically. So by 1900, the most advanced areas of Europe and the US hold between a tenfold and twelvefold advantage in levels of GDP per capita over their Chinese, Japanese, and Indian equivalents. During the course of the long 19th century as a whole, the share of global GDP held by Asian powers fell from 60% to around a quarter. At the same time, the share of global GDP held by Europe and the settler colonies of the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa rose from around a third to two thirds. So in other words, this was a major shift in global power, as this slide will somewhat complicatedly illustrate. So what you have here is if you, look on the, uh, if you look on your right at the GDP per capita part of this first, what you'll see in 1750 and 1800 is this story of rough equivalence, where what we today call developed countries and we today call the third world countries have a rough equivalence, more, more or less plus or minus 10% in terms of their GDP per capita. Then during the course of the 19th century, there's a dramatic shift. A gap opens between developed countries and what we today call the third world, until by 1913, you've got a 350% advantage held by today's developed polities over today's third world. If you then look in absolute terms at the left-hand side, at the, Jobel, at the uh, figures of total GDP, you get a similarly dramatic story, if anything slightly more dramatic, in that here what we call today uh, developed polities come from a long way back. They start with uh, a relatively minor share of global GDP, during the course of the 19th century, uh, their share increases. Somewhere between 1860 and 1880, they uh, catch up and overtake what we consider to be third world polities today. And by 1913, the year before the onset of World War I, they're around double the portion of global GDP as that held by the third world. So what happened? And this is my final point before I hand over and I nick any more of Barry's time. Acquiring the configuration of industrialization, rational state building, and ideologies of progress meant undergoing wide-ranging political, economic, and cultural transformations. And polities that underwent those transformations held enormous advantages over those that didn't. Although oscillations of power are nothing new in human history, the global transformation opened up a vastly expanded pool of resources, making the power gap both much bigger and much more difficult to close. In this sense, as well as marking a shift in the distribution of power, which is what the discipline of international relations tends to concentrate on, the global transformation changed the basic sources, or what we call the mode of power. By this, we mean that the three dynamics we highlight combine to generate a new basis for how power was constituted, organized, and expressed. And so stark was the shift in the mode of power that we consider world history to have effectively moved into a new period, that of global modernity. And there it is. So that's the argument, that's the basic story of how we got here. Barry's now going to outline the implications of the shift to global modernity and why it matters. Thanks, George. Um, well, I guess my version of this story is that we're living downstream from the global transformation in the 19th century. We're not living downstream from the First World War, despite all the propaganda last year, um, or the Second World War, or the Cold War, or 9-11, all of these are relatively minor events along the way. We are living in the turbulent wake of all of the big changes that happened in the 19th century. That is the core argument of the book. We sum this up by uh, looking at three periods. Um, so there is a kind of implicit periodization in, in here. Uh, and the best way, perhaps, to understand this is to think of it in terms of uneven and combined development. And we're stealing uh, this idea from Justin Rosenberg via, via Trotsky. Um, the idea that, basically, you can look at development in these two variables. Um, uh, how distributed is it? How even or uneven is it? And how combined is it? In other words, how much is, everybody else, is everybody's development connected to everybody else's development? 
And we see, therefore, three periods. Two of these are historical periods, and one of them is a speculative period, because we simply couldn't resist the idea um, of rolling with what seemed to be the historical momentum um, of the argument. So the first two periods we think of as, as being a kind of centered globalism. What happens between the early part of the 19th century and 1945 is the setting up of a highly centered international society. We call this Western colonial international society. Um, it was based on empire. It saw the creation of uh, an integrated global economy. And the, the main feature of it is that it was exceptionally uneven in the sense that because of the change in the mode of power, which was commanded by a relatively small number of societies, the, the concentration of power was extreme. Um, one way of thinking about this is the distinction uh, quite uh, commonly used in IR between developed and developing countries. That distinction was defined at this point in time. And the number of developed countries was relatively small. Uh, but they had, because of the change of the mode of power that George described, they had an enormous power advantage um, over the rest and were able to set up a colonial international society in which uh, sovereignty was divided uh, and this small group of powers more or less had the whip hand. So at this point, um, uh, in terms of uneven and combined development, it was highly unequal and for the first time, highly combined, because this small number of modern countries put together a world economy on the basis of new modes of transportation, the steamship uh, and the railway and the telegraph. One of the things that comes out of this is the uh, extraordinarily interesting story of Japan. Japan uh, tends to be thought of rather marginally in the way the story of international relations is told. Um, but Japan is the huge exception. It's the only country outside the West that gets the problem of modernity very quickly, very early on, um, and transforms itself in such a way as to outrun uh, many parts of what we think of as the West in terms of development. So Japan quite quickly uh, joins the core and indeed joins it as a great power. So the first period, the first consequence, if you like, uh, for international relations of the global transformations is to create this um, highly unequal but highly combined uh, uh, system, a Western colonial international society. From 1945 onward, this begins to loosen, but it still remains a centered kind of globalism. Um, and the label we give, uh, we give this is Western Global International Society. Decolonization happens, so there's a considerable letting go um, of formal political control. Um, sovereign uh, equality becomes the norm rather than divided sovereignty. Um, the military equation evens out um, a bit. The degree of combined development continues to increase, uh, but the economy and the economic advantage largely stay with, uh, with the West. Although during this period, which we are maybe just leaving, um, or uh, uh, anyway, it's the period that we have, uh, most of us, lived through. During this period, we begin to see um, uh, a diminution of uh, the inequality side of development. Um, this can be um, summed up in Fareed Zakaria's nice phrase, the rise of the rest. Basically what that means is that others are beginning to get hold of uh, the revolutions of modernity and to acquire the power that goes with it. From this point of view, Japan can be seen as the beginning of the rise of the rest. But the particular miracle of the Japanese story is that, that nothing followed this for another century. But now, uh, China and India and, and a variety of other uh, countries and societies are beginning to get hold of this, and therefore the unevenness uh, of development is beginning to, to reduce. There's also been a certain working out of the, of the ideological puzzles that George described in the sense that um, uh, clearly scientific racism uh, has not dominated uh, since uh, 1945. It was delegitimized then. Um, and socialism as a form of government has not done very well 
um, either in, it remains intellectually lively, but as a form of government, uh, has not been tremendously successful. So the big winners, uh, if you like, of this ideational working out have been capitalism, not necessarily democracy, but capitalism, um, and nationalism. They are the unqualified successes uh, of these ideologies of progress. Where this takes us, and I know I've only got a couple of minutes left, is into a speculative realm that we call decentered globalism. In other words, if we see this momentum working out, the world is becoming increasingly combined, um, but less and less unequal in terms of development, because modernity um, is spreading, uh, we get a world with a number of features. The first one is almost certainly no superpowers. Okay. Superpowers for were, we think of it as being normal that a small number of countries should dominate the planet. But if you stop to think about this, that's actually rather weird. Right? Mm -hmm. How is it that a country like Britain, a relatively small country, was able to both occupy India and beat up China without breaking sweat? Well, not on the basis of the number of people, for sure, but on the basis of the difference in the mode of power. Right? And that difference is disappearing. So demography is coming back. And nobody, uh, we argue, is going to be able to acquire the relative resources necessary to be a superpower anymore. We used to have three superpowers, then two, then one, and the next way, the next stopping point along the way is, we argue, uh, zero. So we're heading for a world of decentered globalism, which will have quite a few great powers and quite a few regional powers, but no superpowers. This world will have a much narrower ideological bandwidth than we are used to. Because basically, uh, like it or not, we are all capitalists now. Capitalism seems to be the road to power and wealth. And since those are widely desired objectives, uh, basically there's been, we're not arguing now about capitalist or not. We're arguing about what kind of capitalist. Are you a democratic capitalist or an authoritarian capitalist or, or whatever? So there's been some kind of first order resolution of the, the ideological framing for modernity. It's not completely worked out, but it's much narrower than it was. It's going to be more combined. Shared fates, um, uh, both the economy and the environment and a variety of issues um, from uh, weapons of mass destruction to migration and terrorism, all of this seems uh, likely to, uh, to become more and more combined. We're going to be more in each other's pockets, more sharing each other's fates. So this seems to be the world in which, towards which we are moving. And it's quite a different world from the, the one described by mainstream IR, which is still arguing about, is China going to be a superpower? Is America going to remain a superpower? Those are the wrong questions in this historical perspective, because nobody's going to be a superpower. And therefore, um, things like polarity theory rather go out the window. Now, I'm probably just about out of time. Yeah, two more minutes. Two more minutes? OK, then I'll just say a couple of things. Because where we end up um, in this book, and this is only for the nerdy IR part of the audience here. The rest of you can doze off for a minute or two. Um, the, there are two things we do here. One, we try to provide a historical narrative that links together all of the various diverse bodies of theory that go to make up international relations and to pose interesting puzzles for, uh, for each of them. So to the realists, we pose the mode of power problem. You know, realists are obsessed with the distribution of power, but they don't think about the mode of power. And the mode of power is a bigger kind of change, opening up very hard to close uh, gaps. Constructivists don't seem to think about the fact that in the 19th century, the entire ideational landscape was remade by these four ideologies of progress. The way we conceived ourselves as everything from individuals to societies and states changed very profoundly in the light of these, uh, of these changes. So there are things that need to be, uh, need to be thought about there. Also, one of the, the neater discoveries we, we came up with was that if you look at the uh, the discourse around development, which kind of seems to spring out of nowhere after the Second World War and decolonization, it's actually almost identical to the discourse of colonial administration. Right? The language is very different because the colonial, colonial administration language is quite racist, but the substance of the stuff is almost identical. How do you deal with unequal development and, and the social consequences of all that? So 
we end up arguing that um, IR needs to abandon its myth that it was founded in 1919 and it was a great and glorious enterprise uh, devoted to solving the problem of war and peace and to look at some of its darker roots um, in imperialism, in colonial administration, in geopolitics, uh, in the discourse of scientific racism, basically all of the, uh, the agenda and most of the topics of international relations were being discussed well back into the 19th century. This did not start uh, in 1919. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those fascinating uh, insights into the book. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Aisha, who's going to present our first set of comments. Thank you. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here discussing this uh, most excellent book in such esteemed company. Um, I'm going to start uh, by referring to the online symposium about the book that's hosted at the uh, website Disorder of Things. Uh, in that symposium, Julian Go notes that uh, the book makes primarily two contributions, uh, as uh, just discussed uh, by George and Barry uh, uh, right now. Uh, one about uh, the actual fundamental global transformation in the 19th century, and uh, the second contribution about uh, disciplinary IR and how uh, the discipline of IR needs to recognize this transformation and reconfigure its identity and agenda accordingly. And then a goal goes on to say, well, I'm not really interested in the second part. I'm going to discuss the historical transformation. And I suspect many in this room are also uh, in agreement with Go that the 19th century is a much more interesting subject for conversation than the discipline of IR. <laughs> now, unfortunately for me, I've been given the task of <laughs> discussing the discipline and how this book stands in relation to the discipline. But I've accepted this challenge with relish, uh, and I will be uh, provocative, uh, because both because I think that the book has a lot uh, to offer to IR as a discipline, and also because I'm worried that the contribution of the book to IR will be lost uh, amidst the rush, the very understandable rush to debate, debate and engage with the substantive claims made in the book about 19th century. Now, in the same online symposium, uh, there are uh, a number of criticisms. I, I, everybody is in agreement that this, the book is a masterpiece, but there are a number of uh, criticisms uh, which I uh, can categorize into two varieties. The first, as expressed by Mulik, uh, is a proper historian's criticism that things were actually much more complicated in the 19th century and less in set, set in stone than the book makes them seem. And the second, as expressed by Allison and to some extent by Go, has to do with the fact that the book is a bit cagey about its theoretical pedigree and uh, somewhat non-committal in its uh, 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 sampling of the literatures. It flirts with a lot of literatures but doesn't commit to any particular one. Uh, and as compelling as these criticisms are, and I may agree with some of them personally, when we're evaluating the book's contribution to IR as a discipline, uh, they are largely irrelevant in the same way that if, you know, if someone gives this, uh, bread to s a starving person, uh, whether that bread was you know, organic and made by you know, artisanal bakers uh, and from, uh, from humane farms, etc., it would be uh, irrelevant. Uh, and make no mistake, I IR as a discipline is in a much uh, worse situation than a starving person. Uh, 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 <laughs> It has long been fragmented as a discipline, but in these days, it's in real danger uh, of falling apart as a field of inquiry. Uh, this has been evident for a while. Of course, you, would, you, you, would, you could say those of you who are not in IR uh, and not, are, are not privy to our endless discussions about this uh, might say, well, it's the most popular major and you know, everybody 
wants to uh, do a master's in international relations and ISA is bigger than ever, how could the discipline be in trouble? It's in trouble precisely because the discipline, or at least the mainstream of the discipline, neither understands nor can address intelligently the processes underlying the motivations that drive students to our classes, uh, away from why, why people turn away from the study of politics, domestic politics and government, and why they want to learn about international relations. The mainstream of the discipline has no way of discussing, let alone explaining, global change. It cannot properly imagine a world, uh, for instance, where most polities are not states, where political authority has been severed from its ontological or law-giving powers, where sovereignty is divided or overlapping, or any other scenario that is any kind of departure from the very historically contingent arrangement created by the 19th century processes detailed in this book. As a re result, IR as a discipline has had very little to say about the transformation that we're living uh, through at the moment. Other disciplines have been debating our times in a world historical sense for a while, for decades, geographers, sociologists, historians, philosophers, and even economists. Uh, they've been asking, are we at the end, next stage of capitalism, modernity, are we having a systemic crisis, uh, et cetera. IR has, in general, stayed away from these grand debates, busying itself with epistemological turf wars in the 1990s, and more recently, we've declared the end of theory. Uh, and in the US, the end of uh, theory has largely resulted in the discipline being overtaken by simple hypothesis testing executed on poorly constructed data sets built on anachronistic assumptions. In Europe, uh, uh, this has resulted in increasingly, in parts of Europe, let me say, since I'm in Europe, uh, 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 in increasingly insular scholarship communities organized around interpretations of the teachings of particular theorists. What this means that as a discipline, today we're happy to accept students who are driven to our classrooms uh, because of a, a gut level or an un ontological unease about the blurring of lines between inside, outside, uh, domestic, international. But we are unwilling to engage with the larger debate among social sciences and humanities. We don't have much to say about the world out there to the world out there. It was more than 20 years ago, that, in 1993 to be precise, that John Ruggie argued in an essay called Territoriality and Beyond, Problematizing Modernity in International Relations, more or less what I'm arguing today. He said the modern system of states was in the process of being remade. He also stated that the long and the short of it is that we're, uh, we're not very good as a discipline at studying the possibility of fundamental discontinuity in the international system. That is, at addressing the question of whether the modern system of states may be yielding in some instances to postmodern forms of configuring political space. We lack even an adequate vocabulary. What we cannot describe, we cannot explain. His solution was to turn to history, in this particular case, the transformation from the medieval to modern. Even if we may disagree here with Ruggie as to what the appropriate period of transformation to study is, I think his impulse to study the past in order to make sense of the post-Cold War transformation of the present and the future was a really good one. Uh, he was right in arguing that therein lies the discipline's salvation. And very few, unfortunately, have answered this call I think this, with their seminal book, George and Barry take the biggest step in that direction anyone has taken. While doing so, they have also exposed why the discipline has been so ill-equipped to deal with systemic change. The mainstream theories of IR, for all their claims about universality and timelessness and generalizability, are as much a product of their time as those taught in marketing departments and business schools. They cannot explain the past or the future because they themselves rest on historically contingent assumptions about agency and statehood and core periphery problems. Uh, if taken as a quasi-metaphysical realization about human nature, realism perhaps is timeless. But in its current version, it makes all sorts of assumptions about states and the system that uh, George and Barry demonstrate came to be con conceivable as assumptions only after the 19th century. Similarly, liberalism in IR is a 
blend of a certain type of modernist ideological optimism with a thin and ahistorical institutionalism. Uh, its influence is not derived from its explanatory powers, but from the appeal of its normative values. Which brings me to my first criticism of the book uh, that we're discussing, and I will conclude with some criticisms. Uh, in part three, uh, chapter 10, uh, by way of concluding, the authors speculate about how the concepts discussed in the book may help illuminate the thinking of existing IR schools. So this is some of the stuff that Barry discussed just now. Uh, making helpful suggestions like realists need to think more about the mode of power, etc. They have suggestions for each school. I think this is very kind on the part of the authors, but ultimately I think it's a cop-out uh, because there's no way to read the book, the first two parts of the book, in a serious manner and come out of it with one's faith in any of the schools of IR intact. <laughs> So if there are still such persons as orthodox neorealists and neo or neoliberals or constructivists, etc., what they should do is read the book and not take away from it a new way of thinking about power, but an actual, what they should do is have a genuine crisis of faith. What am I doing? <laughs> I am in the matrix. Uh, and my second criticism also has to do with part three, uh, the future scenarios that Barry just discussed. I think here some of the, uh, the assumptions that the authors are critiquing uh, from in the discipline, especially the assumptions of liberal uh, teleology, uh, make their way back into the argument. Um, I think the authors un underestimate the damage done to non-Western polities by their encounter with modernity and overestimate their willingness to play, or willingness of these polities to play nicely in the future. Um, it is important, so, uh, you know, there are statements like more non-Western powers will acquire the configuration of power associated with modernity, which sounds to me like, you know, they are simply behind and they will catch up, which is the same kind of assumption that we've been uh, criticizing. So it's important to realize that non-Western countries are not simply behind. They're also transformed by the same processes detailed in the book. Uh, so they are other products of modernity. They're, they're not just uh, uh, behind. And also, uh, oh, I'm about to conclude, so I, I, will, I, I will be done early. Um, also, what's missing from the book on that account, I think, uh, is some discussion of anti modernism or anti-Westernism uh, as a modern ideology. So the four ideologies covered uh, sometimes display elements of anti-Westernism or anti-modernism, but I think uh, anti-modernism could be thought of as a, an ideological current in its own right. Uh, you know, uh, that's what I thought reading the book, and it's been surprisingly appealing uh, whether we're talking about, you know, Putin or, you know, ISIS, I, I don't mean to say that they share the same ideology, but there's something here uh, <coughs> in the rejection of uh, the modern as, uh, and its association with the West that is being overlooked in the, you know, the future scenarios about how everyone catches up and the world is without a center and finally, you know, we've arrived at a, a space, a safe space for everyone. Um, that future scenario makes me think if, if uh, the conclusion of shedding our 20th century parochialism is the same future uh, <coughs> predicted by liberal institutionalism, why shed that parochialism at all? So uh, if there are any criticisms to be made by the book, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, towards its desire uh, to end on a somewhat optimistic uh, note about the international system. Uh, I think if it uh, owns up to its revolutionary potential, both in terms of its description of the international system and also uh, in terms of its implications um, uh, for the discipline of IR, it will uh, make a great contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha, for some really fascinating comments there. And I, I hope we're going to pick up on some of them, particularly the, the anti-Westernism. Um, over to you, Jürgen. Yes, thank you. What, what a peaceful world is history <laughs> compared to IR. 
Um, historians may hate each other on a personal basis, but there doesn't seem to be that, that kind of deep methodological rift mm -hmm. that, that goes through, well, IR sociology, if I may say so. Uh, but this is not my, my, my topic. Um, I have to warn you at the beginning, uh, I'm a very bad book launcher, and the reason simply is that in my country, Germany, uh, non-fiction books are usually not being launched. The only books that, that are launched are, are novels and politicians' memoirs, also kind of fiction, but uh, very rarely um, academic contributions. Now, for me, this is a, a kind of uh, return, a homecoming to LSE after 38 years, because in 1976-77, uh, I underwent thorough and personal training in diplomatic history at the Department of International History uh, by Professor Ian Nish, the eminent historian uh, of Japanese foreign relations, and I listened to uh, Don Donald Cameron Watt, James Joel, and the often quoted Ernest Gellner, uh, important reference in, in your book. I'm saying uh, this to indicate that there are different ways to global history. I'm here as the representative, in a way, of global history, as we uh, heard before. There are um, various ways. Uh, my way didn't begin with a general enthusiasm for, go for globality or for, um, for post-colonialism, but uh, as I said, with a very thorough training in international history. I think this is quite in important in the general configuration of disciplines. I published a book in English earlier this year called, again, Transformation, Transformation of the World. It's a global history, a general history of the 19th century, and it contains a chapter on, on war, peace, and international relations. And that raised eyebrows among my fellow global historians because there's still this, this idea of a deep antagonism between global history and international history, and I think we, we have to overcome that. My personal belief is that global history needs three supporting disciplines from the systematic social sciences, the ethnology, historical sociology, and international relations. Now, uh, the publication of this marvelous book is a major event for a number of reasons, for a number of disciplines. I use my license here to disregard at least two different aspects of the book. Um, one is, uh, that has already been dis discussed right now, uh, the return of history to IIR. I mean, there we are sort of in a re reciprocal situation. Uh, historians, uh, as you know, are nowadays supposed to, uh, to be very knowledgeable about theories. And of course, this brings us very often into a difficult situation, and we sort of make, make fools of, of ourselves. On the other, uh, uh, the other way around, uh, we uh, have to be very patient up to now. Now, everybody uh, will have read the book, and the whole level will been raised, but we have to be very patient with uh, IR colleagues talking about history, because they will, start, <laughs> they will start telling us nice stories about the Westphalian system, and then we have to be very patient uh, to uh, persuade them that things are not all that, that easy. So the, the book will sort of lift us out of this quagmire, um, and I won't follow up on, on this. The, the second uh, point I will disregard is uh, the prognosis. You, you have, um, again, um, eloquently um, uh, presented to us. Uh, I hope uh, that we are on the way to decentered globalism, that the future will confirm um, your expect and our expectations, uh, but a basic requirement, um, as you um, argue in the book, of uh, decentered uh, globalism is the existence of uh, responsible, stress on responsible great powers, and there are not very many of them around at the moment. Now, uh, the book is a, is a huge and unique achievement. I read it with great excitement and pleasure. It treats a vast subject with uh, great argumentative power and concentration, and it steers a perfect middle course between overlofty theorizing and a misplaced concreteness. It's a major achievement, at least in six respects. First of all, a very almost banal point, it has absorbed a huge amount of historical literature, very judiciously chosen 
uh, this again is a is a, a sort of a delightful experience to meet social scientists who not haven't just read many books about history, but the right ones, and who are <laughs> and, and who, who have developed a, a very sort of. Uh, um, a subtle feeling for the, the state of the debate, for, for quality in historical research. That's very uh, impressive. The book is entirely up to date. And uh, because we are sticking off details, I must say I found only two minor factual errors. More about that after, <laughs> <laughs> after the, the, the proceedings. But it's good and, that you're enacting the historian. <laughs> this. Of course, uh, that's, that's what I'm being paid for. Uh, and I must say, there, uh, there's one vice that we all uh, are sharing all the time, and this is, uh, I think, uh, a confident over-reliance on uh, statistics and estimates by Madison and by Rock uh, on, on uh, pre-modern periods. Um, again, a different subject. So this is point number one. Point number two, uh, it makes a highly convincing case for the novelty of the 19th century, not in the vulgar way of a Big Bang uh, argument or a quantum leap argument, but by using the, I think, very well chosen term of the intertwining of factors that led in the 19th century to a push of qualitative change within the space of two or three uh, generations. One could look at things differently at a lower level. Uh, this is my historian's perspective. One would probably uh, see more incremental change, but it's really a matter of the, of the search optics, how you adjust it. And uh, at the level chosen by our authors, I would follow them uh, entirely. One could argue for more continuity, but I think the, the uh, argument is, uh, is consistent. Um, by uh, reviving the, the flagging spirits of the Disney Mist, uh, there was an article a couple of, of years ago uh, by a famous story of the 19th century, Bye Bye to the 19th Century. I think you've done us a great uh, 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 service, and we now have a set of very strong arguments uh, for the 19th century as the birth of the modern world. This leads me to point number three. This is a, a contribution to the great, great divergence debate, although you don't really make this explicit. And I understand this to be a clever strategy, because the, the, um, sorry, the Great Divergence debate is now getting bogged down into a kind of autoreferential critique of, of authors. And by not uh, really um, uh, adopting the label, you dispense yourself uh, from sort of joining this, this, this battle and in, in, in fighting between the, the various positions. But you make a contribution, a very uh, important uh, one, in the sense that the, the debate so far, the great divergence debate, prom runs and so on, has established uh, the, and you uh, mentioned that, uh, George, in your um, introduction, the 18th century equilibrium thesis. Now the onus is shifted into the 19th century, but there the debate ends. Very few authors have really sort of dealt with the 19th century at any, any length, and you, you have now uh, done it. And I think this is an enormous achievement, and also related to this, uh, it's very impressive how you overcome the sterile opposition between materialist explanations, that means economic and ecological explanations, from runs would be an, an example for that, and cultural or culturalist. Um, uh, interpretations of the Landis Ferguson type. You again sort of come up with a, with a sort of, uh, not not really a, um, a contradict, uh, um, contradiction free uh, solution, but with a, t a tangential kind of kind of synthesis. A fourth point: periodization. This um, is probably a, a more technical uh, point, uh, but again uh, here you. Um, um, advance an interesting uh, position. There are, of course, nowadays uh, so many um, defined, self-defined ages and many centuries. Everybody has got his or her own century. And there's now recent, most recent contribution, interesting one, in a, in a book by James uh, Galvin, a co um, collection, and Nile Green on glo global Muslims. They talk about the age of um, steam and print, mid-19th century to, to the 1930s. But you make a very strong case for the importance of the first half 
the 19th century, agreed, I'm convinced. And then uh, at, the, at the other end, for a very long 19th century, that in many respects goes up to 1945, for example, in terms of military um, uh, history. So uh, um, the, the famous um, First World War as a caesura is probably not the, the um, ultimate solution. Uh, briefly, uh, two more points. The, the inter interpretive framework, as I reconstruct it, um, I'm now doing it from a reader's perspective, which is a bit different from, from the, the author's way of putting it, is a three-dimensional one. I think you have a three-dimensional analytical framework consisting of first dimension, the triad industrialization plus rational state plus ideologies of progress, and the, the most original part uh, are the ideologies. That's very impressive, uh, especially in as much um, nowadays global intellectual history is establishing itself as a separate field, unrelated to, to the various contexts where it uh, could play an important role. Second dimension, interaction capacity, your, your uh, older concept, very, very important as a, as a functional category, physical and social interaction capacity, and uh, as I see it, the third, they mention um, are the patterns of hierarchy in, in various sort of elaborations. And the last point is, again, uh, in parallel to, to what I said about the Great Divergence, this is a book on globalization, but you use the, the term very sparingly and for very, very good reasons. Uh, you, there are a couple of gentle pol polemical asides against globalization enthusiasts. Thank you very much. I'm not one of them. Uh, and there are offhand remarks like, for example, globalization being born in the last quarter of the 19th century. Well, uh, but the avoidance of the term, I think, is, is very, um, a very clever uh, strategy because it's now, it has become a kind of self-explaining master concept uh, and you are in infusing into this discourse on networks and the weaving of flat webs uh, uh, Jelnerite or Michael Manish or I would say Weberian uh, respect for power. Now perhaps three, uh, because I've run out of my time, three minor critical points. First is that uh, whenever one talks about well, globalization of course, but also on the same level of abstraction modernity, there is the danger that we do not uh, distinguish properly and sharply enough between explicandum or explanandum and explicans. It's not always as clear as it should be what is explained by which factors. There's a danger of tautology. And it may be inherent, I'm not now in a position to spell this out in detail, inherent in, in the argument. You, you do quite a lot to avoid it, but one has always be, uh, be very uh, careful about that. Secondly, you talk about the rational state. I'm not quite sure whether this is in 19th century. This is really supportable. I mean, in Weber, of course, uh, the state itself never is rational, but uh, parts of it, bureaucratic sort of elements within the state, uh, undergo rationalization. So is it possible, are there today any rational political systems around in the world? Is the, the American political system a rational one? Chinese one isn't, certainly, it certainly isn't American. I have my doubts. So this is a, a minor point. And uh, uh, finally, uh, very impressive uh, 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 has been throughout the book and the, and the presentation what you are saying about dyna dynamics and processes, this, this nice um, slides um, made the point. Uh, the book is especially good on the interplay of imperialism, revolution, and capitalism, with revolution as the surprise guest at the, at the table. But then there are certain inconsistencies, as I, I see it, or perhaps slippages in formulation. For example, and, and, and perhaps an, a kind of irritating bluntness. There is uh, uh, at one point the idea that transformation happens and the rest of the world has to react to it, to the, the core. Or on one page, the, the, let me just quote one page, one, 171, there is at the beginning of the page uh, the statement that the core states, and this is a very strong, I think, statement, quote, conducted a multiple assault on peoples around the world. And then further down the page, we read uh, that we are not talking ab about transformation in which, it's a quote, in which a change arose uh, autonomously in one place and was then exported to the rest of the system, which is a position uh, much more sort of to my taste. 
but we have those two contradictory statements on one and the same page, and there might be a slight inconsistency in the, in the argument. Uh, this is taken from chapter six, my favorite chapter, not probably in terms of, of um, theoretical weight, but in, in, in terms of practicability of the text as, a, as, a, as, a teach, as teaching material. Uh, that's the chapter I would give to the students for allowing them to get into the book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jürgen. And now finally, Craig, for your comments. All right, thanks. Well, we're having a wonderful celebration of unity among international relations, global history, and historical sociology. And I'm pleased to be included. I should say that I'm not a very global historical sociologist. I'm a slightly global and rather international um, sociologist, and I'm a relatively national historian, as it happens, um, in an odd mix. So it's, it's nice to be invited into this, but I would begin remembering uh, the decisive moment at which I became a sociologist while I was studying history at Oxford, and my, my doctorate's <laughs> actually in history. And um, one of the leading Oxford historians said to me, sort of, very interesting, this work you're doing. Couldn't you really sort of zero in and concretize it, say in 1811? Why do you need to look at 30 years of history? And I concluded that I really didn't want to study 1811 for the rest of my <laughs> life and liked broader perspectives um, and at least would go so far as sociology, if not IR. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, one of the great features of the terrific book that we have before us is that nothing is left out. Um, so it includes everything. So when I um, raise questions, there are questions about emphasis because the authors have really um, touched on all of the things, but some of the things I will say deserved more attention or we should note the large attention to them. You should note that um, I had a failed strategy of reading. Um, having this demanding day job, I thought, right, when I accepted this, I would read the introduction and the conclusion and uh, be able to make very good comments. The <laughs> copy of the book which I received is missing the introduction. <laughs> it skips from Roman numeral six to page 12. Um, <clears throat> that completely destroyed the plan, in addition to which there is no conclusion. Instead, there is actually a wonderful chapter exploring the implications of um, the argument for a variety of different subjects and all of that, but not exactly a conclusion. So I was actually forced to read some of the middle of the book, and um, my comments will reflect a slightly hasty reading of the middle of the book. Um, let me comment on that. So I, I'm not going to comment on that last chapter, which, um, however, should not be seen as just an exploration of the implications of the argument for international relations because, in fact, it takes up a variety of other um, pretty significant um, issues here, including issues that international relations isn't always focused on, like periodization um, and the debates about periodization that are important, um, as well as the other things that have been brought in of power and security and globalization, ideology, ideational structure. What I want to say is it's um, and already been hinted at by, by Jürgen, it's a pleasure to read a book that does not start in 1648. Um, the, there was, as, uh, as Barry remarked, this long fashion for starting IR stories in 1919, but the answer to that has been starting IR stories in 1648 often. And so there are the range of Westphalian state stories at, in which it would appear that the instant at which there was international treaty formation was the instance of fully um, formed nation states, which then um, constituted the struggles of international relations. One of the really good contributions of this book is to stress the simultaneity of nationalism and empire. And the projects of state building informed by nationalism in Europe, that happened as part and parcel of the same history with the formation of European empires. Um, this is, when you say it like this, obviously true. So it's quite remarkable how it's been repressed from our history. It's remarkable the extent to which the way in which we've divided up academic fields has encouraged us not to give this the weight um, that it deserves and to tell stories of European national development 
um, with empire to the side and to tell stories um, of empire um, as global history separate from full integration. Um, there's also another moment, though, to stories of IR history, which is not figured here, and which is interesting, which is the Schmittians immediately after World War II. Um, and there is a different account of, of states and the centrality of, of states and of thinking of IR and how to theorize this, which has its relationship to the rise of realism and to various other disciplinary histories, but which is also significant for the way in which um, we have a reminder here of how much these discipline, these histories of IR are actually histories of how to look at the world after a series of great conflicts. Um, how much of this is 1648, ah, well, 100 years war, 1919, we're going after World War II, that we have a series of, um, of disciplinary engagements with a world and trying to make sense of a world that has been changed by war, in part. I'll come back to that. Now, I'm um, very much persuaded also by the centrality of the 19th century story. And it's, I'll just mention in passing, the significance of this as an IR story is one part of it, but it's also significant in relation to the dominant work of global historical sociology. So um, figures like um, Michael Mann, Emmanuel Wallerstein, various others don't always center on this. Even Anthony Giddens, who's cited here in our LSE version of this story. Um, the 19th century, um, which is, of course, pivotal to the rise of sociology, isn't the claim at the center of this. So much of the historical sociology either is extraordinarily universally global, like Michael Mann, or centered on the 17th century. And lots of the work sees the great transformation that is pivotal to creating um, the world as we know it and will theorize it as a 17th century transformation, a slightly different 17th century transformations. It can be the Westphalian piece, but it can also be the shift um, from um, uh, the domination of uh, the Netherlands to Britain in global capitalism and other stories, but, but seem usually as a 17th century story. So I'm much taken with the 19th century story. I won't add to the, the aside about the great differentiation story, which is touched on, as Jürgen said, and, and engaged delicately. Um, this Ken Pomerantz, Ian Morris, the whole series of, of debates about this, save for one thing um, in this. As one thinks what gets conceptualized and incorporated into the account here, one of the things that is minimally incorporated is technology. And so this isn't an account that is centered on technology, in, as many of the uh, great divergence accounts will play with, either contesting and claiming knowledge or care or abandoning um, technological um, innovations. Um, as I said, I, I appreciate very much the simultaneity of nationalism and empire in the account and the relation of both to industrialization, to the rational state argument, as it happens, I agree with Jürgen again about when and where and how completely rational the states were. And there is a sort of Weber by Giddens kind of account of, of the state and of rationalization as a process in this. Um, but it sort of gets elided a little bit into the rational state. And I um, wonder both whether we would really sustain the contrast um, fully looking at uh, Chinese history, say, with European histories, um, or is it really the case that there is as much rationalization, but also what do we miss by seeing the state? We see a certain part of the bureaucracy um, through this rationalization lens, and we miss a lot else. Um, now, in this, something else that is not front and center, and I would put more front and center, is capitalism. So this, the, the Lawson and, and um, Bazan really mean industrialization. Industrialization yields capitalism, capitalism figures in it, um, it's there, it's not a driver. So this is not an account in which capitalism is a driver of historical change, not as much as I would be inclined to make it. So for example, there is not a theorization of a drive to growth to account for the expansion 
on the expansionist tendencies of European powers. There's, um, neither is there an account of the intensification um, of production as such. Um, so it really is industrialization. That's not necessarily a fault, except for those of us who um, still see a, an argument about capitalism, um, including capitalist class relations, but particularly capitalism as an economic system is mattering. It is an argument about modernity, and modernity as a package, George said it in his introduction here, an assemblage. It is not a claim about a theorized integrated unity. It's a claim about several things that happen at once, reinforce each other, and fit together to make modernity. So the account of the ideal, um, ideologies of progress that matter, the account of industrialization, the account of the state, and so forth, but not a tight account of them being um, closely, causally integrated. Um, modernity happens. Modernity isn't a causal, um, a claim that is subjected to a causal explanation. There are in this curious echoes of modernization theory, um, and, and I think Aisha's point and reference back to some symposium is good on this. I won't go into it. Um, let me, given time, make just um, a, a few last comments. Um, I like the way in which the nationalism account figures, and I want to, again to question aid and emphasis in it. The account is of Nationalism, nation is the basis of state. That's what nationalism is about. I think this is a central. It's a side in a big argument, which the LSE has been central. What I want to question is the argument that is the nation is self-identifying. So for um, Bazan and Lawson, the nation is self-identifying and poses the claim to be the right and essential basis for a state. What this misses, it seems to me, is the extent to which nations and nationalism are always other identifying, imposed by ascription from others, imposed by international conflicts. There is never one nation's history that happens internally alone, always interplay. Actually, a good insight of international relations as a field, it seems to me. And this brings up the role of war and of interstate competition which are not absent, as I said at the beginning, nothing is absent, but, um, but not um, in uh, the driver's seat here of, of this account, especially before the 20th century when the issues of cost competition as an aspect of, of war come to the fore. It's not a Tilly-esque account, it's not an account of um, a system driven by war, and it seems to me that competition was always part of nationalism and the state, and it's very hard to fully conceptualize them. And the competition among the European states is, of course, part of how the West attacked the rest. The West didn't just go attack the rest. The hegemonic power of Europe, Britain, didn't just go attack the rest. It was in a competition with European powers doing this, and this shaped what was going on. In addition, internal domination inside nation states um, is very important, and the production um, of the nation um, through material conditions, um, transportation and media systems, state power, teaching language, and so forth, um, the kind of things that in a, um, a lovely book Susan Cop Watkins points out when she points to the growing similarities of fertility patterns inside European states during this same 19th century, um, and the way in which the nation gets produced in that kind of, of phenomena. This seems to me, and readily available to be a, a close hand in glove relationship to mode of power here about um, the domestic power of the world, European states. Let me move to two last points and shut up. Um, one is um, I am broadly persuaded by the account um, of first a move from a polycentric world to a core periphery world to now the combined and unequal development in a um, increasingly decentered globalism with a small but about how polycentric at the beginning. So I'm actually still would want to play out the argument of Wallerstein's world systems, that while the whole world is very polycentric in these earlier periods, world systems are not necessarily polycentric. There's actually a lot of domination in the European-centered world of a single power. Um, but I'm more interested in two other things, and I'll close with them. One is the extent to which um, the process um, of transformation, which I want to identify more with capitalism, produces a rise of the social, um, and whether the social matters in this. So is part of the story of the state not simply rationalization, but Polanyi's double movement?
the need to compensate for the depredations of capitalism, the extent to which capitalist success destroys communities, destroys traditional welfare systems, creates needs that are met by insurance and multiple mutual benefit societies, but then by welfare states. And, and isn't the story of the rise of the state driven in some part by that and from below? Um, secondly, though, um, I buy about three quarters of the core argument of the uh, of where this leaves us. No more superpowers. Yes, demography is coming back. Yes, decentered globalism. Uh, sort of. Um, now, my questions. One, U.S. power is declining. U.S. hegemony in this system is declining. How does the U.S. let go and yield the relatively happy and optimistic results? Um, that the book offers rather than what we see in the world around us. And it looks to me like the process of declining U.S. hegemony is a lot less benign um, than the rise of a simply multiple, uh, multi-centered world. But do we get a multilateral world? That is, is this a world of multiple powers coordinating their action and stabilizing this world, or is this chaos? And what I don't find is a clear reason, a clear way to answer this. Um, do we get six, eight, ten um, powers stabilizing the world in a way, or do we really get total chaos? And um, finally, in that, uh, the question of what future we have, I find hard to answer without asking whether capitalism is um, changing in a crisis terminally or morphing, and I have in mind things like crises of institutions, the enormous weakness and fragility of institutions in many settings, the struggle to rebuild them, the problems of dealing with um, climate change, and the very real threat of war. Um, so I, I, I want to register an appeal for some rather traditional categories of analysis in trying to make sense of the contemporary global situation. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, I'd just like to give Barry and George a moment to respond to the panel's comments, um, and then I'm going to open it to the floor for questions. Just We're wondering, yeah. you just go, go straight, straight ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, roving mic, is the roving mic ready? Yeah. If you can wait for the microphone to reach you, um, raise your hand if you have a question, and please say your name, and if you have an affiliation, please state that as well. Lady at the back, um, if the microphone could go then. Lady at the back row there. Yep. Far back row on the left. Uh, thank you very much. On? Is it on? No. Anyway. Uh, hello, I'm Mira Sabaratnam uh, from SOAS. I um, also had the pleasure of uh, reading the book, which is great, and you should, you should all read it. Um, I have a question about the work that ideology does in your model, because it's there, but I wonder whether it kind of drops out of any of the explanatory um, or the kind of... Um, motor of what the transformation is about. And I was struck by Barry's comment that, uh, you know, when colonialism finishes and racism is discredited, actually developmentalism uh, simply takes its place in a practical sense. Uh, so the question is, does ideology actually do any work in terms of changing the direction of the global transformation, or is it really the industrialization and the state building that is, is driving things forward? Do you want to address that question straight away? Right. Yep. Let's and take we'll gather some others. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. over there. You can just move the mic over there. Uh, yeah, James Morrison, uh, LSE IR. So I apologize in advance. This is inside baseball. Um, so I'm curious about the significance of your start date, 1776. The title of your book and that start date made me think of this classic piece by American historian Bernard Balin, 1776. Uh, you have challenged the world transformed. And he talks about all these events in 1776 and makes the case that this really is one of the greatest years in all of history. And of course, I'm quite inclined to agree with that. <laughs> um, there was definitely something to this period. But let me play devil's advocate. And let me ask you um, sort of specifically about 1776, and even more specifically, where is Adam Smith in your story? And I ask about Smith both as a historical actor who helped to shape some of the transformations you describe, I think indubitably, but also as someone who was commenting on transformations that he would argue were at least a century old by the time he went to look at them. And I'll provide one simple example, and that's differential development. Major theme in the wealth of nations. 
But for Smith, it's not about Europe versus the Yangtze Delta. It's the same question that Locke asked, and it's about Europe versus the Americas. And so Locke and Rousseau and Smith <coughs> asking this old question by this point, right, leads to the patterns of colonization, colonial control, industrialization, all these kinds of things as well. So I guess Smith would say, look, these are old changes, and um, they predate even my hmm. um, magnum opus. OK. Is there a third question? We'll take as well. Yep, this one there in the center. And then I'm going to pass back to the authors. Gentleman just beside the pillar there. Uh, hi, um, Jacob. I'm a student here at LSE and IR Theory. Um, Barry, you mentioned that of the ideologies of progress that have kind of uh, succeeded at this moment of time, and we're looking at in the future, capitalism is that the one uh, is one of the ones that has stuck with us and is kind of leading to this kind of process of um, an evening out of power distribution, of a global decentering. Um, and I wondered if you kind of uh, saw a contradiction in this in terms of capitalism um, as a driving force in terms of um, uneven development, but now coming to the fore as a force for the future um, in terms of kind of an evening out. Um, and I, I thought there was kind of a little bit of a contradiction there. Great. OK. Barry and George. Do you want me to kick off and you do? All right, I'll start. I want to go back to Aisha's because they were fun. Um, should we give up on IR? I've got no problem. I mean, give up on IR if you want. We would, we're obviously a bit nicer in that regard. It's the same when it comes to fragmentation. I'm not particularly bothered about the fragmentation, bar the each to their totem pole type of fragmentation that you talk about. I do get that that's a potentially serious problem. The other side of that is you're studying the international component of X, then you're welcome in international relations. To, the, to that extent, it comes from an openness that I think is potentially quite rewarding. In terms of the, the point that you and Craig, I think, discuss about, are we too happy clappy, you know, at the end? Are we happy clappy? I mean, are we? We're happy clappy people in the audience and nodding, even those that haven't read the book. Um, <laughs> I don't, it's certainly not a story of liberal teleology, I think, getting smuggled back in. We talk about varieties of capitalism and authoritarian varieties of capitalism. We talk about how stable they are, at least potentially, and how generative they are of power and wealth. If we're happy clappy, then it's simply one that's a fairly reserved position by saying that the world is clearly going to have to get used to a more plural type of international order, including in terms of how it manages itself institutionally. And that may well not be a very nice story. If the world is becoming more regional, then if you're in Russia's backyard, it's probably not the best story you've ever heard. And there may be other parts of the world, not least Southeast Asia, that think similarly. Or we'll see what people think in the Americas and so on. So I think we're relatively agnostic about what a plural international, decentered international order would look like. And it's not that everyone is becoming more liberal, far from it. In fact, we're going to have to get used to fundamental difference. But actually, in contrast to some of uh, Craig's concerns about what that world might look like, I think one of the big surprises post-2007, 2008, is the world didn't fall apart, that actually the institutional order held, and new institutional mechanisms were established that generated some type of relatively stable plural order. So will the US go quietly? No. Will Europe? Uh, sort itself out and stand up anymore? Probably not. Will parts of the world look quite unpleasant as, as a result? Probably so. But whether there's still going to be some basic institutional order that maintains a slip into great power war or the type of conflict that could be existential, then I'm much, uh, I'm much more skeptical. One final point, because I can't possibly address all the questions. I'm going to leave the difficult ones for Barry anyway. Uh, anti-modern is not the same thing as anti-Western, and that's a big difference. Uh, clearly, Putin is anti-Western. Uh, even while he embraces some of the tactics and, and sort of formulations of, of being Western. But that's a very different thing than being anti-modern. It strikes me that ISIS are extremely modern. You know, Putin is extremely modern in the technologies or messages that they have or the way that they organize themselves or, 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 or various other components. So that's true about anti-Westernism. We talk about that as a mobilizing force in, in some parts of the world, not least Japan and how important that was. And we also talk, that in, in, talk about that in terms of your own work, Aisha, and, and the role of stigma and how that was generative of different modernizing missions, but they were modernizing missions, even when they were conceived differently than the originators in this regard. They were still, it strikes me, as modern, even while they were anti-Western. Right. Um, well, I have to say, I'm very uh, pleased to have been identified with an optimistic book <laughs> while my wife is in the room, <laughs> um, since she tends to think of me as something of a pessimist. Um, so this, this, is a, this is a good move. Um, I think 
Um, yeah, I don't think we're in the business of destroying IR. I mean, John Haslam would never forgive us if we did that, because we'd, we'd have then destroyed the market that we've aimed the book at. So uh, this this wouldn't uh, this wouldn't wouldn't go. But I think it's important to say, uh, in relation to a number of the comments, that um, we were not setting out to try and explain the global transformation. Right? Um, better minds than ours have been trying to do this for a very long time um, and not come up with anything, or not come up with a consensus um, on it. Our task, as we saw it, was to say, this thing happened, and here's what it looked like. It was this complex configuration of multiply mutually causing things. What are its consequences for IR? So we're not, in a sense, trying to deal with the causation, because I don't, I mean, that would be another book, quite different book um, with a quite different purpose, um, and I don't think I'm going to live long enough to actually get to the end of a project of that, uh, of that sort. So we're simply taking it as, as given, which is not, I think, controversial, um, and I think we've given a fair summary of what it was, and the novel part of the book is to say, okay, this happened, um, we don't pay much attention to it, but it actually defines most of the things that we, in, in terms of IR, um, are interested in. Uh, because I think the, the benchmarking issue that some people raised is, is important. Um, the, uh, the, the comments about war as the principal driver in the system. I mean, international relations thinks about war in that way, and that defines its principal benchmarks. But on that basis, it, the IR benchmarks go from 1648 to 1919 as if nothing happened. Right? So the discipline doesn't pay any attention to things that are actually enormous changes. They may be ideational changes or economic changes or technological changes or social changes that aren't expressed in wars. It only looks at wars. Um, and this, it seems to me, is a, is a huge mistake, and it, it goes a long way towards explaining um, the blindness towards the, uh, towards the 19th century. Um, I think the, the other thing I want to comment on is the, um, that, it's basically in, in response to Aisha, I think that um, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that the state system is being blown away in the, in the way that you, uh, that you think about it. It seems to me that the, if, you, if you understand the state system as being composed of a conjuncture of three ideas, basically sovereignty, territoriality, and nationalism. Right? So nationalism legitimizes it, and territoriality and sovereignty are the, are the package. Right? As modernity spreads, that seems to me to becoming more and more consolidated. I mean, you don't have to spend very long in China to see that they are absolutely and totally wedded to that um, idea. Um, and India is not far behind, and most of the other major emerging powers are totally bought into that package. Um, the, uh, I agree um, and uh, admire your work very much on this about you know, the historical damage that was done to a variety of societies about, uh, uh, by the spread of modernity. But again, I think, I mean, to my mind, one of the big insights that came out of this for me was this, this story of Japan. Right? It is possible to get around this in some quite substantial ways. I'm not saying that Japan was undamaged, and you, and you have your own a, a account of that. Um, but it, it does seem to me that the, the, this system is much more resilient than you think that it is. If it's vulnerable anywhere, it seems to me, it's vulnerable to the fact that um, the mechanisms of, uh, of, of large amounts of destruction are becoming available to ever smaller groups of people. This is the kind of Martin Rees argument, if you want to get totally depressed. There's a great book out there by the Astronomer Royal called Our Final Century. Or if you buy the American edition, it's called Our Final Hour, which tells you, <laughs> tell, tells you something about the cultural difference between, <laughs> between these two. Uh, uh, and this will, uh, gives you a, a sort of slow walk through all the ways in which we can commit species suicide now, whether intentionally or, or not. That, it does seem to me, is quite worrying. And since that does question the basic territorial and, and sovereignty framings of things, because how, how do you conduct politics in a kind of unit veto world where any um, uh, uh, aggrieved uh, minority or even aggrieved individuals can wield large amounts of destructive power? This is tough. Okay. Uh, time for one final question. Anyone a final question? Yep. Gentleman there. 
you very much. What do you think just, well, a debate, when I was a, a student in the Internet Related Department many years ago, there was a debate about the historical literary approach uh, and behavioral scientific approach to international relations. I don't know whether that's still debated now. Maybe both approaches are relevant. Um, I had a tutor, Michael Banks, expert in one, and Hedley Ball in the other. I just don't any of the panelists could say anything about that. Anything about that particular debate, George? We're with Bull. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and the debate goes on. <laughs> okay. One final, final question, gentlemen in the front there. Very quickly, if you please. As, as we have <coughs> Professor uh, Oster Hammer here tonight, I, I'd just like to comment on the fact that um, uh, Angela <coughs> um, Merkel seems to be seems to have an understanding because she was born and raised in a communi under a communist regime and she speaks fluent Russian, that she has an understanding of Putin and the, and the Russian mindset. Whereas the Americans, uh, particularly people right of center there, are gun-ho in terms of you know, uh, make, uh, being, making a very assertive, aggressive statement, including the shipment of arms to Kiev. Could you speak about the difference briefly about how they, how, um, within international relations, how the hegemon, the US, fails to understand, because of the ge geographical isolation, un fails to understand how the, the cultural difference in outlook and perspective of other countries. Okay, that's the very final question. So any, any thoughts on that, Barry? Um. I don't have much to say about that, but I'll answer one or two of the other, uh, the other questions. I think in, in Mira's question, I mean, what, what work does ideology do um, in the global transformation? Well, I think an interesting way to think about that is to say, if you take those four ideas out of the 20th century, nationalism, liberalism, socialism, and scientific racism, nothing happened, basically. <laughs> So these provide all of the dynamics by which we understand ourselves and uh, construct our conflicts and our identities and blah, 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 blah. They do just gigantic amounts of, of work. So I'm, I'm not quite, I may be missing your point, but uh, I'm not quite sure what you're, you're getting at there. Um, yes, and I think the, the 1776 question, um, that's a kind of infinite regress question in, in the sense you can go back forever and ever and say everything has prior roots and causalities uh, and that's always true. Um, I think the reason why we focus on the 19th century is because it's when all of these things begin to have big consequences. Right? The ideas and the antecedents and precedents are all around for a long time. But the package that comes together in the 19th century produces this gigantic power shift and this gigantic ideational shift and begins to change things everywhere right? in, in very big ways. And that is not happening by 1776. That's happening um, by the 1840s. Okay. It just remains for me to thank the audience, all of you, for your attention, for coming along tonight. Um, I, I wish you a lovely evening. I'd like to thank our speakers, our panelists, and our authors for a fascinating debate. And I'd recommend that you all have a look at the book on your way out. Uh, it's there for purchase, as at any good book launch. So my job is to basically plug it at the end. Please do uh, buy it here. Okay, thank you.